Good evening, class, and welcome to another lecture presented by the Institute of Divine Metaphysical Research. Now, this is a school and not a church. Neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational religious and scientific research organization dedicated to proving the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout the ages to this present day. This school is the result of a divine vision and revelation of that vision given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We were later incorporated in the state of California in 1958 and have gone about since that time to set up branch schools across the United States and in various foreign countries. The Syracuse class was established in 1969. At this time, I would like to acknowledge the president of our Syracuse class, Dr. Robert Welsh, and the vice president of our class, Dr. John Cometti. Now, in this school, we use the true, original, and correct names and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of our Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title of the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. And the true name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted to read Jesus or Jesus Christ. Now, Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but it is a divine title. That means that it is the title that our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. Uh, of, uh, a small investigation on your part into a good encyclopedia or dictionary will prove to you that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, or the Latin language had any characters or symbols that would produce the sound that is made by the letter J. Neither was there a letter J in our own English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah, making such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible in incorrect renderings of the true name of our Savior, Yahshua. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Now, Yahweh is pure spirit. And in his pure spirit form, he is inscrutable and indiscernible. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything in our creation. We have Yahweh depicted on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh's not a cloud. Yahweh, Yahweh merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular shape or form. Now Yahweh knowing that man could not perceive him, him in this shape takes on form takes on shape and takes on form right within himself as Elohim, the Son or the Word, a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man but without flesh and blood. This form could only be seen in divine vision and understood with a divine revelation. Later on, this self-same form manifests himself in a physical body and walks the earth plain as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there's only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question is, what was the name of our Savior when he walked the earth plain? A further understanding 
of this name and or these names and this title may be had by reading the preface of a holy name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh leads the children of Israel out of Egypt, he calls Moses on top of Mount Sinai and shows Moses this tabernacle pattern in a vision. He instructs Moses to return to, Sin to the wilderness of Sinai and build one exactly as he had seen it. This tabernacle pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court that goes round about. These three compartments making up the one tabernacle pattern. We also go about in the school to show proof how everything in our creation operates according to the function and operation of this threefold tabernacle pattern and how absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Now in this school we have ten primary constitutional aims and objectives and they are as follows. First is to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he actually is and tr as he really is and actually exists. Two is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers that are latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern both practical and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the dragon, the serpent, the devil, or Satan and his demons, operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation in faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth is to make known that Yahweh, from the beginning ordained there is no other name, given among men whereby man must be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the newer st state. Our slogan is to speak the truth and our watchword is peace. Our scripture this evening will be Hebrews, the eighth chapter, that and all... Oh. Sorry, our scripture this evening will be Hebrews, the ninth chapter. That and all scripture will be read by our scripture readers, Dr. Deb Kometty and Dr. Scott Miller. That will be followed by a prayer by Dr. John Frazier and hospitality announcements following that. Thank you. our hearts and minds. Yahweh, thank you for bringing us down here again tonight and for revealing all, everything, well, so much about you to us. Please let us stay focused tonight so we can pick up a few more small gems. With that, let us all say, Hallelujah. Scripture reading tonight is Hebrews, the ninth chapter. I'll be reading from a Schofield Reference Bible, inserting the true and correct names. Hebrews 9 and 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and an earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, 
the first and which was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, and which was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherub of glory overshadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus prepared, the priests went also into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of Elohim. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Spirit thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in foods and drinks and various washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But the Messiah being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of the Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to Elohim, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living Elohim? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they who are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator lives. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which Elohim hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For the Messiah is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of Elohim for us. Neither yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once, in the end of the ages, he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so the Messiah was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him should he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. That's Hebrews the ninth chapter. Good evening, class. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you tonight and to welcome you to our school to learn more of Yahweh's eternal purpose, pattern, and plan. Um, it is the way to salvation for all of us. So it's vital that we are all here as often as we can be here to continue to learn of this great, this great teaching. 
and what else to say. Uh, we have no first time visitors or returning guests. Um, so for my first speaker tonight, or our first speaker tonight, I'd like to call on Dr. Bill Warren. Good evening, class. Well, that was a surprise, but I am happy and glad to be here and happy to be in a place where I can learn anything about my creator for sure. Um, and that's unusual. It's just not like that in the world. Um, it, the truth about the Creator just isn't taught out there. Uh, and not until coming down here did I find out that you could prove it for yourself, for your own knowledge, um, the truth about the Creator. Uh, and when I first started coming to these classes, um, probably even the first class, I'm thinking, um, it was said that um, Yahweh has a purpose, and that purpose is being played out. Um, from that point on, I sit in the class for many years now, learning a lot of different pieces of that purpose. And um, it all really adds up to show you how Yahweh exists and how he is working that purpose. Um, and that he's going by a pattern. And that's what's uh, being talked about in uh, the scripture reading. Why don't we just start reading the scripture reading at one there. Hebrews 9 and 1. Then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service in a worldly sanctuary. So it's talking about the first covenant. Now that's something I didn't know anything about before coming into this class. Um, that there was a first covenant, which then kind of alludes to the fact that there's a covenant after that, uh, or a second covenant. Now this is talking about the first covenant, and it's a covenant that he made with the children of Israel. Um, and um, it kind of relates in the Bible to the um, the Old Testament or the Old Covenant and a New Covenant. The world out there really have has them completely mingled together. They uh, the things that are written in the law are things that they're actually trying to perform now to be righteous, thinking that that's the new covenant. And uh, really it's just all the preachers, and really specifically it's uh, this mystery here, this mystery of iniquity that's in operation uh, that is really causing all this misinformation, all, all this um, fake news, I guess yeah. that's today's yeah. word for it, right? Yeah. Uh, that is being perpetrated uh, well, by, by really pretty much all of the uh, preachers out there. One of them pretty famous that uh, just passed away this week, yeah. Billy Graham. And everybody thought he was just great because he counseled presidents and so on, but not to the truth he didn't, because he didn't know the truth. Uh, and the truth was just so contrary to what he preached. Um, you know, they look at the things that the one they call Jesus Christ did when he walked the earth plane, 
saying that those are the things that you have to do to be righteous. And that's really the general thought out there in the world. And that's just not the case. So we come in here and we find out, really after a while, it wasn't even our own choosing that brought us in here. Because we see people come in, sit for a class, and then never come back. They just aren't shown the importance of knowing the truth about your Creator and or it conflicts dramatically with things that they thought about the Creator. And we find out pretty soon after attending some of these classes that your thoughts don't matter and that's what you want really corrected. Let's get uh, Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55 and 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, saith Yahweh. So this is Yahweh saying, my thoughts are not your thoughts. The thoughts of man are nothing like the thoughts of the Creator. We all had thoughts, even, even me. I wasn't really religious. You know, I was, when I was little, I was made to go to Sunday school and that kind of thing. But I really didn't have any interest in any kind of religion or God, as it were. And yet, when I came in here and sat for a while, I realized I did have thoughts, and the things that, they, that were being taught here were contrary to those thoughts. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we want corrected by the truth. Go ahead. So my thoughts are not your thoughts, saith Yahweh. Mm -hmm. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Go ahead. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and returns not there, but waters the earth, and makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. See, now this is talking about the purpose of Yahweh. This is when he took on shape and form as Yahweh Elohim, he formulated a purpose. And that's what this is talking about. His word, this is known as the word of Yahweh or Yahweh Elohim. And his word went forth. And what did it say? It will accomplish? Mm -hmm. Read that. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. See, it'll accomplish that which I please, that which he has set up right from the foundation of the world. It is going to accomplish that. There's no two ways about it. See, we come to find out this is a very powerful creator that is in control of absolutely everything within his purpose. What's within his purpose? Everything that exists. It says in uh, Jeremiah, I think, all souls are his. Yeah. You, you don't even own your own soul. Although it is operating under one mystery or another. There's two mysteries. I, I already mentioned one mystery, a mystery of iniquity. And there's also a mystery of righteousness, or Yahshua. And guess what? Yahweh is operating both mysteries. See, he created this one to be contrast to this one. He's operating both mysteries. Now that's something uh, that's not too well received when you talk to anybody in the Christian world. <laughs> to, to find out that Yahweh actually created the mystery of... Why don't we get that real quick? Uh, 45 and 7 in Isaiah there, I think. And there's other references. Isaiah 45 and 7. I form the light and create darkness. See, he creates darkness. Go ahead. I make peace and create evil. He creates evil. It's right there in the book, you know? And if you, you believe that book, there's other places in there that you can get that say the same thing. So, he's got a purpose. And he condescended or took on a lower state of existence as Yahweh Elohim. This was the word of Yahweh. And that word went forth and it will accomplish that which Yahweh pleases. That's, that's just a given. It's not a God like most religions have that when Adam was in the garden, when he took of that fruit, that messed up God's plan. That's just not the way it is. 
And um, because there's a pattern in operation, see, this is Yahweh Elohim. Let's get that in John 1. John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Yahweh, and the Word was Yahweh. See, this is the Word pictured on this chart. Yahweh Elohim, and this is the Word. And in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning of what? In the beginning of this purpose of Yahweh, which encompasses everything that exists, the whole universe in its totality, and everything that's going on in it. So in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with Yahweh, and the Word was Yahweh. It was Yahweh himself, pure spirit, condescending into a lower state of existence as Yahweh Elohim, or the Word of Yahweh, going forth. And in this form, he created the whole creation and is operating the purpose that was that was, um, I'm not sure how to say it, created when he took on the shape and form. Everything in that purpose was, it was basically done here, but it had to be manifest, and still is being manifest. So now, he, he brought Moses up into this mount and showed how he took on shape and form, and, that, and he showed him also how he was the pattern of all things, like it says up here. Elohim, the archetype, original pattern of the universe. That's Yahweh Elohim, that's the archetype, of which this tabernacle that he then instructed Moses to go down and build in the wilderness of Sinai, that was just a type, so that you could know something about Yahweh Elohim. Uh, and let's, let's get that in uh, Romans 1, 19 and 20. Romans 119, because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest. See, you can know something about Yahweh. And he says, now that which can be known of Yahweh is manifest in them. Who, who is that talking about? If you read up earlier in the chapter, it's those that hold the truth in unrighteousness. It's manifest in them as well. It's manifest in everything. This pattern, like the moderator said, everything is made by this pattern. Nothing escapes that pattern. Go ahead and read. For Yahweh has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation. So now the invisible, invisible things of him, see he's in pure spirit state of existence is incomprehensible. Again, like the moderator said, incomprehensible. There's nothing that you can detect or um, analyze about pure spirit. Except now he created this physical creation. Pick that up a little bit and go on. Um, because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them, for Yahweh has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him. So all, all of Yahweh, what, what invisible things are of Yahweh? He's, he's invisible. <laughs> there is no visible of Yahweh, pure spirit. So the invisible things of him, read. From the creation of the world. From the creation of the world, this whole creation that Yahweh, that he brought in as Yahweh Elohim, read. Are clearly seen. Are clearly seen, read. Being understood by the things that are made. Being understood by the things that are made, or the physical things of this world, read. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So that they are without excuse. So now, here's Yahweh Elohim appearing to Moses up here in the mount, and telling him to go down and build this tabernacle. This is a physical tabernacle. So that you could know, so that they could back here, and that we can now know something about Yahweh and the invisible things of him. So the physical things that are created in the creation point to Yahweh. They point to Yahweh Elohim. They're made by this pattern. See, again, this one is the pattern, and he gave Moses this pattern to build in the wilderness representative of him. 
Now let's go back to um, Hebrews. Sure. <laughs> uh, Hebrews 9 and 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and an earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick. And see, it, uh, see, it had, pick it up in the first verse again. Then, ver then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service. Of divine service. You see, there's service that went on in, in this tabernacle that he built in the wilderness. And to perform that service, you had a priesthood, right? And, uh, and that, um, go ahead. And an earthly sanctuary. And an earthly sanctuary, see a physical sanctuary, pointing up the real sanctuary that's Yahweh Elohim, or Yahshua the Messiah. Read. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick, and the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. Or the holy place, go ahead. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Or the most holy place. Go ahead. Which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And those were the things that were contained in the mercy seat. Read. And over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of Elohim. <clears throat> but into the second went the high... Priest. See, so they went oftentimes in here, right? Down here, see, there was a law given. And Moses read the law to the people, and the people said, all that Yahweh has said we will do. See, that was the covenant. That was the old covenant, or the first covenant that was talked about uh, a few minutes ago. That was the first covenant that was made with Yahweh's people, who at that time were the Israelites, the Jews, and only the Jews. That covenant was never intended or that any Gentile do anything contained in this law. It was only for the Jews, and this was for a type and a shadow. Just like this is a type and a shadow of Yahweh Elohim and how he is the pattern, that's a type and a shadow. Um, go ahead. Uh, verse 7, But into the second went the high priest alone once every year. So now they do this all year. Where Now this law that was given and the people said we would do, they couldn't do it. Even though they tried. They tried and tried. But they failed every time. Why was that? Let's get that in uh, Deuteronomy uh, Six, is it six twenty-five, or is it uh, five? Five twenty-nine, right? Deuteronomy five and twenty-nine. Oh, that there were such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. See, if there were a heart in them, they would have been able to keep this. If this was in their nature to keep then they would have been able to keep it. But there wasn't a heart in them, and that was the problem. And this was really to point that up, that they needed something, yeah. something other than what they were equipped with at that time. And this was really a result of what happened back here in the garden. And also, why, really, it had to happen that way. You see, uh, let me just go on here a little bit and then go back to that. Where this high priest then went once a year up into this most holy place. Well, all year long, he, they're operating down here and, and uh, offering up sacrifices for the sins of the people, right? So somebody sinned, they would bring an offering. It would be offered up. And, uh, and there, was, there was daily stuff that they had to do up in this holy place as well. And they operated here all year long. And so that person that sinned, if they didn't bring a sacrifice, they would be killed. They would be stoned. 
and instead of them being stoned, it was set up so that they could bring a sacrifice and it could be sacrificed on this altar and it would die instead of them. See, it was an innocent sacrifice. That's important. And it wasn't always an animal, it was fruits of the field. There were various uh, sacrifices that had to be made for the type of sin that they did. But all year long, they'd be sinning, they'd be offering this sacrifice up, it would die instead of them, and they'd be saved alive. See, it brought in, this, this really brought in life. Um, so now, once a year, the high priest would go up into this most holy place, and um, he'd go up, and I don't really recall the order, maybe somebody can help me with that, but he would go up um, for his own sins, and he would go up for the uh, cleansing of the tabernacle. I think that was probably first, right? Do, do you recall? I think himself first. Himself first, and then he goes up for the cleansing of the tabernacle because this was sin that's going on here all year long, and it had to be cleansed of that sin. So there was offering then made for the cleansing of the tabernacle, and then he went up and offered um, uh, a ram was offered then for the the sins of the people. And when, when that happened, there were trumpets that sounded and, and all that, that he achieved atonement for all of Israel. For that moment in time, Israel was right with Yahweh. And then immediately after that, they went about sinning again. Why? Because they didn't have a heart in them. It wasn't really meant for them to keep, but rather to see that they couldn't keep it and that they needed help. So this high priest then, once he achieved this atonement, had to come back down. And he's dealing with this sin all year long again. But rather than look at it from a standpoint of him being down here and going up once, really, if you look at it, think about it, atonement is really the starting place. All this happens, and then the end is declared right from the beginning that he's back up here standing before Yahweh in atonement. Um, and that can be likened unto Yahweh, pure spirit, in the very beginning taking on shape and form as Yahweh Elohim, bringing forth this creation and, it, and coming down to perform that salvation and then it going back up. So that high priest is really up here, coming down, and then going back up. Now, uh, let's see, what do we have hanging there? Oh, I know, I was in, uh, talking about Adam. So now here's, here's uh, Yahweh Elohim. He brings in the creation, and on the sixth day, he brings in man, right? He created Adam, then from the dust of the ground, and he was placed in the garden, as it would be the, the most holy place of the pattern, pictured here on this chart, um, depicting the most holy place here in the tabernacle. So at this point, Adam is innocent, and just by virtue of how Yahweh Elohim in pure spirit had to come down, let's get uh, Revelations 13.8. Uh, Revelation 13 and 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. See, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and that is Yahweh Elohim, who, again, he condescended or took on a lower state of existence. It was as a death coming down into this shape and form. And then further down into this form as Yahshua the Messiah. Let's finish that in uh, John 1 if you're still hanging on to that. John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the Word, 
And the word was with Yahweh, and the word was Yahweh. Read. The same was in the beginning with Yahweh. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Read. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. See, in him was life. See, what did he do with Adam? When he created him of the dust of the ground, he breathed into him the breath of life. He's the only one that has life. He's the one that animates every man that comes into the world. Isn't that what it is? Read that again. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Go ahead. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from Elohim whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. Why don't you drop down to uh, 14? Verse 14. And the word was See, made and flesh. this word was then made flesh. Read. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And that's Yahshua the Messiah. Not what the world calls, they call him Jesus Christ, and they've got a whole different Savior than the one that is true. Because they, they've got him coming in, setting up a Christian way of life, and doing all these things under the Old Covenant. Um, that is the Old Covenant, not the New. Uh, but anyways... Uh, he breathed into Adam the breath of life and then placed him in the garden. And then he put him in a deep sleep and brought forth Eve, right? Um, why don't we get that? What is it? Genesis 2 and 21. Okay. And Yahweh Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which Yahweh Elohim had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Go ahead. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. And See, so it, it, it kind of gives you an inkling right there. He, he brought Eve out of Adam and what does it say? Therefore shall a man leave his mother and father or he will, and who's his mother and father at that point? Yahweh Elohim. He created Adam from the dust of the ground. See, he's father and mother. That's, the, the word Elohim is pluralistic. Right, right. You can get that in a common dictionary. Right. It's pluralistic. He's male and female within himself because doesn't it take a male and female to have offspring? Well, here's Adam. He created Adam from the dust of the ground, made him alive, and then brought forth his bride right from within Adam. Right? right? Mm -hmm. So now, or she was separated from Adam. That's another way to look at it, right? He, she was once within him, and now she's separated from him. And it's uh, actually, you can kind of see that here with Yahweh Elohim, where he brought forth the creation, or that creation was within him, right? And it was brought forth, they were separated from him. So you have uh, the bride now being separated from the man, and what does that typically mean in the flesh? Mm -hmm. That she's subject to deception. See, what did Yahweh Elohim say to Adam? He said, uh, well, maybe we should get that, uh, of the tree of the midst. See, it's good to get all these scriptures, even though we hear them a lot, because that's where the proof lies, not me in regurgitating it. Right. It's in the scriptures that are written in the Bible, because you can go and read those. Right. And you can go to that anytime you want or need it. Um, Genesis 2 and 17. 
Um, I'll pick it up in 15. And Yahweh Elohim took the man and put him into the Garden of Edom, Eden, to dress it and to keep it. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh Elohim commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou may eat, may freely eat. Now, there were a lot of trees in the garden, and they were overladen with fruit. That garden was ready for them when they, when they got there. Right. And they could eat of any of them, except what? But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. See, now, did that say if he ate it, that he would die? It said, in the day. See, there's little things that we never really perceived before coming into this class. But once your attention is brought to it, it's really got significance. In the day. Read it again. Uh, this is um, Genesis 2 and 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, Thou shalt surely die. So see, it was foreordained that he would eat of that fruit. So in the day that you should eat of that fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden or the tree of good knowledge of good and evil, mm -hmm. you're going to die. Mm -hmm. So what happened? Uh, why don't you drop down to that where Satan appears to Eve. Uh, Genesis 3 and 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any piece of the field which Yahweh Elohim had made. And he See, said, he's subtle. He's a master of deception. Go ahead. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath Elohim said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, Elohim hath said, You shall not eat of it, Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, is that what Elohim said? Pick it up again. Back over and... No, no, right where you were. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> now, this, uh, he said unto the woman, Yea, hath Elohim said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Right. And the woman said unto the serpent. Now this is the woman telling the serpent what, yeah, now did, was Eve around when he said this to Adam? No. 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 So she didn't get it directly from Yahweh Elohim. Mm -hmm. And here's, here's proof of that. Read on. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, Elohim has said, you shall not eat of it. You shall not eat of it, yes. right? He said that, right? right. Neither For shall in the day, go ahead. Neither yes. shall you touch it, lest you die. If you touch it, you will die. Is that what he said? No. No, he said, in the day that you eat of it, you will die. Mm -hmm. For ordaining that that would happen. Mm -hmm. Her interpretation of it, well, if we touch it, we'll die. So we better not do that. See, there's a, there's a way that seemeth right unto man, right. but those ways are unto death. Yeah. It's not, my, it's my thoughts are not your thoughts, saith Yahweh. Mm -hmm. So man's thoughts ain't going to get it. So what you got to find and learn about is Yahweh's thoughts. Yeah. That's what's happening in these classes here. Uh, is there more there? Um, no, go ahead and keep going there. Where she just said what uh, what Yahweh said, her interpretation of it. Okay. Right? Um, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, Elohim has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. Go ahead. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. See, there's, there's where the deception comes in. One little word he changed. You shall not surely die. Go ahead. For Elohim doth know that in the day ye eat thereof. Now here's where the sub subtility comes in, or the de and or the deception. For Elohim knows. Go ahead. That in the day ye eat thereof. Then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You'll, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be as gods. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it was right, their eyes would be opened, but not, not in the best way. <laughs> their eyes, when she took of that fruit, when he took of that fruit, their eyes were open to the flesh. Where the, prior to that, they were walking and talking with Yahweh Elohim, or at one with him, in the most holy place, just like this high priest was up here when he's achieving atonement for Israel. So here she is then, separated from the husband and subject to deception, taking that fruit. And uh, why don't you get where she gives to her husband? <laughs> saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now why would he eat? Because of the way that Yahweh built him. Mm -hmm. right. See, there's a thing, I never heard this word before coming into this class, but there's a thing called philoprogenitiveness, or philoprogenitive love, and that's love that a parent has for its offspring. And that's not just in humans, that's all throughout nature. There is a love that's an instinctive love that a parent has for offspring. And that is the type of love that Adam had for Eve. Remember, she was drawn out of him. Eve was not only his wife, but his offspring. Now that's not the case anywhere on down the line for a man and a woman getting together. She's not his offspring, but Eve was. Mm -hmm. So he had that instinctive love for Eve that he would die for his bride. See, this is all pointing up, this is all principles pointing up Yahshua, the Messiah, how he died for his bride. So here's Adam back here dying for his bride. And what happens then? There's, there's an instant separation between mankind, or Adam and Eve, and Yahweh Elohim. Remember where, where they were at one? Like the high priest up here, re, uh, achieving atonement or at one for Israel? It didn't last long. An instant later, death. Sin and death. This was the law of sin and death, right? All year long. Right here, atonement. So here we have atonement. What has to happen? There, just like that high priest had to come out, down out of the holy place, Adam had to come down out of this garden. So in the cool of the day, he was driven out of the garden. Now, why would that be? Because Yahweh, pure spirit, suffered a death coming into this lower state of existence. The lamb swayed from the foundation of the world and then further coming down in the flesh and suffering this death on the cross to put an end to sin or to manifest as that innocent sacrifice, the only acceptable sacrifice that would put an end to sin after the law. Um, let's go back to Hebrews uh, 9. Uh, now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of Elohim. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself. See, he had to take blood up here. And he had to sprinkle this blood before the mercy seat. Matter of fact, he had to uh, sprinkle it seven times. Go ahead. Um, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. See, so he offered it for himself, uh, again, for the cleansing of the tabernacle and for the sins of the people, then ultimately achieving atonement for Israel. Read. The Holy Spirit, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. While as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Go ahead. Which was a figure for the time then present. See, this was just a figure for the time then present. What was that time then present? This was a time that 
Yahweh Elohim's people, Israel, were under this old covenant. And it was never meant for them to be at one, or achieving this at one minute that Adam and all of mankind left. We should really get that. Let's hold that and go over to Romans 5. See, this state that Adam and Eve left this garden in is significant in the Romans, purpose of Yahweh. Go ahead. Romans 5 and 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world... See, as by, as by one man. Why would it be by the man? He's the one that was given the law. Don't eat of the tree in the midst, right? Go ahead. Sin entered into the world and death by sin. So sin entered in by this one taking of that fruit. Read. And so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. See, that death passed upon all men. All men. See, mankind consisted of Adam and Eve. So this death that he suffered is talking about in Romans here. And this is Paul with a great understanding of the truth about Yahweh. Pick it up again. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And death by sin, read. And so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. See, death passed upon... Now, did Adam die? He, he came out here, and he lived some 930 years. So it's not talking about a physical death. So what kind of death did Adam suffer coming out of the Garden of Eden? It was a death in, in the conscience. He became condemned in his conscience. And that death, or that separation between mankind and Elohim, was... It was passed upon all mankind, which all came from them, right? All of mankind came from Adam and Eve. So that condemned state of mind, or that separated state between mankind and Yahweh Elohim, it was with every man that existed after that. Um, go ahead. Is there For more there? the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is a figure of him that was to come. So from the time that he was driven out of the garden, when he sinned, how, well, how did he sin? He broke the law that Yahweh gave him. Right. He wasn't deceived. It was philoprogenitive love that Yahweh gave him towards his bride is what caused him to do that. So he wasn't deceived, but he partook of that fruit and he was told not to. So that's breaking a law and that is sin, right? So now from Adam to Moses or until this law came in with, with Israel, pick that up again, please. Nevertheless, Death reigned from Adam to Moses. So death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. So it didn't take eating that same fruit that Adam ate to be in this state of mind. It was inherited from Adam. Go ahead. And it wasn't an apple. Go ahead. It was a figure of him that was to come. So that's a figure of him that was to come. Go ahead. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many are dead, much more the grace of Elohim and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Yahshua the Messiah, hath abounded unto many. Or many be made alive. Go ahead. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. What verse are you on? I uh, just read 16. Oh, okay. Uh, I want to get, to maybe just go to 20, I think. Moreover, the law entered that the offense... See, remember, death reigned from Adam to Moses, or when this law came in. Now, it didn't end there. Death reigned here, but... Death or sin isn't obvious until there's something that points it up. That's why the law came in. Read 20 there. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. 
See, the law entered that the offense might abound or it might become obvious that there was a problem here, here, with mankind as it relates to the Creator. That separation or that condemned state of mind. This is what nailed that down for us, reading about it now. We go back to the Law and the Prophets and see how, how this happened and how Israel tried to do this law and couldn't do it. Be, and we can see then that they didn't have the heart in them to do it. So this was really just for a time. Uh, did you finish or is there one more there? Uh, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Thus, as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through the righteousness unto eternal life by Yahshua, the Messiah, our Savior. So, uh, again, this was just a type and a shadow uh, to bring us to the Messiah. Matter of fact, I, I think it says it something like that in Galatians. Um, third chapter? 16? <clears throat> the law. Um, um, that's probably a good place to start. Galatians three and nineteen. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. See, there's another with the same thing. It was added for transgression or to point transgression up. It, was, it, it rained all the way down through here, but it points it up when the law comes in. Go ahead. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but Elohim is one. Where's it talk about the um, the law or schoolmaster? Twenty-four. Ah, okay. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Um, is the law then against the promise of Elohim? Yahweh forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. See, it was a type of righteousness back here. But it was one they couldn't achieve because they were working up on it. And if you work up on something, that's contrary to grace. Mm -hmm. yes. Where coming into a knowledge and understanding of your Creator has nothing to do with works that you perform. It's Him revealing it to you. It's got to be by Him and by His grace. Right. Go ahead. But the Scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Yahshua the Messiah might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up. See, before faith came. See, faith is necessary. Hold that and let's pick up Hebrews 11 real quick. Six, I think. Hebrews 11 and 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to Elohim must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So it's impossible to please Yahweh without faith. And yet, here's this mystery of iniquity in operation again, that he's so subtle and so de deceptive. What, what does the world think that faith is? It's a leap of faith or believing in something that you can't prove or know for a fact. That's not the way Yahweh is at all. Uh, let's get First Thessalonians 5. First uh, Thessalonians 5 and 21. Yep. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Now that's something I never heard before coming into these classes either. Prove all things about your creator, about religion. That's what your book says. Prove all things. And it's absolutely necessary. That's why the witnesses 
that have convinced us. That's what we try to give anybody that will listen those same witnesses so they can check it out in the book rather than believing something that we say. And now that's not the way it is out in the world. The preachers say, believe on me, brother. And they tell them what to do and what not to do and you'll be just fine. That's that mystery of iniquity being subtle and deceiving many. It's, it's just the way it works. Where Yahweh, so simple, prove all things. And then he gives you all the witnesses you need to be convinced. Uh, Isaiah 8 and 20. Isaiah 8 and 20. To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So simple. You just have to go to the law and the prophets to see if what anybody's saying about the Creator is true. To the law and to the testimony. You just need to go there and you can prove it for yourself. That's why we give witnesses when we're talking about the Creator. So that you can prove it to yourself. It's vitally important. Uh, let's see, what do we got hanging? Galatians. Yeah, Galatians, okay. Um, Galatians 3 and 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. See, before faith came. When did faith come? Mm -hmm. Came with this one here. Not in him dying on the cross, but when he died, was buried, resurrected, and then poured out his Holy Spirit. That's where faith came. And that's, with the Holy Spirit getting in men, that's where a man or a woman is reconnected with the Creator, where there was a separation here and a falling away. That's where mankind is reconnected, is by the Holy Spirit in you, and that's where faith comes from. It's not just you believing something because somebody said it, or believing in, in something that you can't prove. It just isn't that way. That's not what faith is. Back in Hebrews 11, it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Evidence, proof, prove all things. Um, go ahead, in Galatians. Shut up unto the faith which should afterward be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. See, that law was our schoolmaster. Well, it was the Jews' schoolmaster. It was only given to the Jews. Why, why would it be our schoolmaster? Because we're looking back at the things that were written in the law and in the prophets to prove the reality of this one here, Yahshua the Messiah, so that we can have confidence or faith, real faith, by his witnesses that he really is operating a purpose from start to finish, and he's working that purpose. Uh, go ahead. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Yahshua, that we might be justified by faith. That we might be justified by faith. See, that's what you want. And that's not, you believe, you believe, see, that's not sufficient. And Dr. Kinley said that. That's just not sufficient. Just believe in it because somebody said it, or even just, it just isn't sufficient. It's got to be by Yahshua revealing it in you. Um, okay, that's Pretty much it there, right? Oh, okay, go ahead. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. See, now when that faith has come, no longer under a physical law. See, Yahshua, when he was on the earth and doing the things that he did in his ministry, he was fulfilling or manifesting the things that were written in the Law and the Prophets, yes, but he was also doing the things contained in this law to bring an end to it. See, when you realize that Yahweh is a unity, remember the Word was with Yahweh and the Word was Yahweh and that Word was made flesh, when you realize that's a unity, you can see that here's Yahweh in the Eloistic form, or the Word, given this covenant, this old covenant, or the first covenant to Israel, saying, do this, e even though he knew they wouldn't be able to, he gave them this tabernacle 
so that they would be able to have life, so that they could bring an innocent sacrifice here and it, when they sinned, and it would die instead of them, all pointing up the one true sacrifice, Yahshua the Messiah. He's the innocent sacrifice. So they do this for a number of years, but there was a course for it to run. And that, that ended when, when, uh, when Yahshua um, resurrected or poured out his Holy Spirit. Um, there was a course that that had to run. Um, and it talks about in Galatians, when the fullness of time is come. That's when Yahshua has completed this law to take it out of the way. You see, it was given to Israel by Yahweh Elohim. And this was as a marriage with Israel. Remember I said, uh, what did Israel say uh, when the covenant was read to them? All that Yahweh has said will we do, or I do. It was a marriage between Israel and Yahweh Elohim. So now you can read in the law how that um, when a, uh, a man's bride uh, agrees to a covenant and uh, she can't keep that covenant, then the husband, this would be Yahweh Elohim in this case, is responsible to do what she can't keep. So, it ran its course, she couldn't do it, so it's got to be him coming in then as Yahshua the Messiah to perform the thing that his bride couldn't do. And in doing it, put an end to this law and ushered in faith. That's why it says, when faith came, no longer under the law. That was done and finished. And what do you have the world doing? the things contained in the law. See that subtle mystery of iniquity, the devil or Satan. He just took this thing and dragged it right over onto the other side of the cross and saying, here's the things you got to do to be righteous. It's just a trick. It's the subtle devil. It's a trick. And you've got the world's ministers and priests and all that out there perpetrating this. That they're all operating under the mystery of iniquity. Why? Because they don't have a heart in them. And that can be changed for any of them, but it's all according to the purpose of Yahweh. Manifest. It was all decided back here, this purpose, and it's being played out. He's working this purpose. Uh, let's go back to Hebrews. that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, well, as the first tabernacle was yet standing, Read. which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. See, all this offering up of sacrifices, when they sinned, it didn't fix them. They went right back out there and sinned. Go ahead. Which stood only in meats and drinks in diverse washings. It stood only in physical things, read. It was a physical law given to a physical people, read. In carnal ordinances imposed In carnal them. ordinances. That's what they agreed to do. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Imposed on them until the time of reformation. See, that was imposed on them. When something's imposed on you, it's not something that's in you. So you're really not going to be able to do it. And they weren't able to do it. It was imposed on them. They were in a spot and they had no choice, really. It was imposed. Go ahead. But Yahshua, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. A greater and more perfect tabernacle. Read. Not made with hands. Not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once. In See, he, he had no pleasure in this. But it was, it had to be manifest. Why? Because there's a pattern in operation. 
That's the pattern. See, we think this is the pattern. This is the pattern of which this is a type. So there's a pattern in operation. It has to be manifest. Just like this purpose that went forth, it has to be manifest. There's no changing it. Yahweh says, I change not. When he took on this shape and form, that purpose was cast in concrete. There's nothing that's going to change. There's no room for change in it. Read. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in. See, water. by his own blood he entered in. He was the one acceptable sacrifice. Like here was a type where they had to kill a lamb, and that lamb's blood had to be sprinkled before the altar. He was really the only acceptable sacrifice to put an end to this. Read. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Eternal redemption for us. Or, or again, he put an end to this law, or... Um, remember how uh, I explained that this, this gendered to life in that they would be killed if they didn't bring an innocent sacrifice? Well, he took this away to bring in something better. Not only, uh, not only in the respect of that Holy Spirit in man, but uh, let's see, I think it's in John 10. I think maybe around nine or 10. Yeah, it started nine. Unto the nine, I am the door. See, he says, this is Yahshua, the Messiah speaking, correct? Mm -hmm. And he says, I am the door. Why would he say that? He's manifesting the things within this tabernacle. Where was the door? There was one door here, right? Just like there was one door in the ark. There was only one way in. And he says, I am the door. Why is that? Because he is the only way unto righteousness or knowledge of Yahweh. Right. right? Go ahead. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pastor. Read. The, ch the thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now, what's that? that's the mystery of iniquity. Right. That's his whole intent, is to kill and to destroy, Right. And he does that by this subtle deception of convincing the whole world that you got to keep these laws. Because look, Jesus Christ did those things when he was on the earth, walking and doing the things that he did. It's, I mean, you look at the book and it seems like, wow, that's, that's what he did. So we got to do those things to be righteous. Well, um, let's hold that just for a sec and go to um, Galatians 4, I think. Um, yeah, 4 4. Yeah. Uh, Galatians 4 and 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, Elohim set forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. There you go. Yahweh Elohim sent forth his son, or he himself was manifest in the flesh. Remember, it has to be that same husband that comes down and does the things that his, his bride couldn't do. So here he is made of a woman, right? He was made of a woman, not a natural. It wasn't a man and woman coming together. This was a specially prepared body, right? Read it again. But when the fullness of time was come... The fullness of time. What, what was that? To put an end to this and usher in something better. That's the Holy Spirit in mankind and faith. Go ahead. Yahweh sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Made of a woman, made under the law. To redeem them that were under the law. To redeem them that were under the law. That we might receive the adoption of sons. So now, here's Yahshua the Messiah in the flesh, right? 
He came in to redeem them that were under the law. He was made of a woman. What did it say? Made under the law. So when he's walking and talking in the flesh, what covenant is he under? The old covenant, or that first covenant. The one that was temporary. Remember, it reigned from Adam to Moses, and then made more obvious by the law coming in. And then here's Yahshua to put an end to that law. And yet, the world's preachers have people uh, they're, they're saying that you've, you've got to do the things contained in this law. Well, if you do, then aren't you calling him a liar that he didn't finish this law and take it out of the way? He was made under this law. That's not the covenant you want. That's the, that's the, the state that mankind was put in from Adam. Remember, their eyes were open to the flesh. See, they didn't have offspring prior to that because they didn't have fleshly thoughts for each other. But their eyes were open to the flesh, driven out of the garden, and that's when the offspring started, right? So their eyes were open to the flesh. Well, you want your eyes open to the spirit. And when you do that, they're closed to the flesh. It's like hot and cold, you can't have both. If you're looking at, uh, I mean, we look at fleshly things, but we look at them to see the principle to see the principle of, that Yahweh's made up of principles, wisdom, intelligence, knowledge, love, beauty, justice, foundation, power, and strength. And to see these principles manifest in the physical, that's the real thing. That's the truth about our Creator. So Yahshua comes in and fulfills this law, takes it out of the way, finishing sin after the law. Now while there was life, this gendered to physical life because it saved them alive. Now, uh, uh, John 10 there. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. See, it's only by him that you can enter in. There's only one way. Go ahead. And shall go in and out and find pastor. Pastor. The thief comes not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. See, that they might have life, not just physical life like here, but he's going to open your eyes to the Spirit and bring in eternal life or life more abundantly by the outpouring of his Holy Spirit in you, revealing the truth about the Creator. Uh, I think... Did I have anything that we, we could get back to Hebrews, but I want to get off the floor, <laughs> leave, <laughs> leave, time, leave time for somebody else. <laughs> Thank you for the time. All praise is to Yahshua. Thank you, Bill. For our next speaker tonight, I'd like to call on Dr. Deb Tometti. I know everybody has enjoyed class tonight. It's, it was a full course meal. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, can definitely appreciate uh, the spirit working through somebody, taking you through the steps of where we've been and where we're going. Um, what I'd like to uh, just continue with uh, where Bill left off, I want to uh, raise a couple of uh, thoughts in your mind Bill had already been dealing with, but they hit me uh, rather hard when uh, he was talking about uh, I like to go back to Exodus the 19th chapter and Ezekiel the 36th chapter and just talk for a minute about where we find ourselves and what this Yahshua has done for us I mean Bill took us A to Z so my job now is just, you know, the cake's been made, and my job is just icing on the cake, just to kind of, you know, finish it off, and we're going to all drive home tonight and say, I'm glad I went, for sure. 
And um, I was telling Scott uh, before class, we had, you know, a pretty, pretty gutsy, pretty meaty, meaty class on Wednesday. It's just, uh, Yashua has just been like, you know, just slamming it out there on us. And um, I think uh, we must need it with uh, the things that have been going on in the world. And uh, there's so much um, heartache and so much suffering. And um, we have to, we have, have the compassion for what's going on, but yet and still we can't fall. Uh, we can't lose sight of the, you know, that crown, that mark of the high calling, and know that Yahshua hasn't left his creatures, his creation. He's still in, in control. And uh, we've been talking a lot about who's the, you know, the, the king and the um, prince of this world and, and what's, what's taking place. But Yahshua is still going to keep us, okay? And, you know, um, just the fact the way Bill was talking about how Yahshua, that woman failed miserably at her covenant. She absolutely failed miserably, and we're going to have that read again. And he picked up the pieces. And, and just the way this is laid out, there was never, ever anyone so marred that his visage, his appearance, you could not tell it was him. That's a beating. And, and you saw that movie. I mean, I thought I was going to have to run out of the theater. It was so mind, uh, I was just, I was overwhelmed when I saw the movie. Because I'm used to this uh, right here. I'm used to this, you know. And to see what was actually taking place, it got me so nervous. I was just like, you know. And this is him picking up the pieces for the bride. And that's who we are. So let's read that, Scott, in um, Exodus. Because here they're being uh, presented with a covenant. And they're, they say, go ahead. I, all that Yahweh or ha, we have said Exodus we. Exodus 19 and 5. Thanks. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed yep. and keep my covenant, mm -hmm. then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So there's something going on there that you have to do, Israel, and if you do it, right, right. then he's, he's got his uh, part too. And what does Israel say? Um, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all the words which Yahweh command, Yahweh Elohim commanded. All the words that Yahweh Elohim commanded, okay? And what did they say? And all the people answered together and said, All Yahweh Elohim have spoken, we will do. We will do. Okay. Now, this was presented to the nation of Israel, and they said, we will do. All that you have said, we will do. Okay. And they did not do it. Okay. So now, when you look at this predicament they're in, and Bill was talking about it in, in great length and detail about that they were able to bring sacrifice here and the sacrifice would take the sin from the people in, in a type because it was never going to atone for them fully or else we didn't need Yahshua. So it's in a type, but it's, it's what Yahweh Elohim allowed at this point to keep the thing going. Okay, he allows the sacrifice to be put on the altar so that they did not die. Because he's, they said, we will do, and they did not do. Right. Okay, so now, in contrast, now this is Israel back in, in the Old Covenant. Now, in contrast, we're going to go to the middle of the book, and we're going to read Ezekiel, the 36th chapter, and now this is going to be the Holy Spirit moving Ezekiel and writing down some information of something that's going to happen. And this is where the joy comes in, and this is where the hope comes in, because so far 
we've just got in the story a, a bunch of people that have failed miserably and cannot, they cannot succeed. They cannot, okay? So now we're going to go over to Ezekiel 36 and 24. Go ahead. Ezekiel 36 and 24. Yes. For I will take you from among the heathen. Yes. And gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. And will bring you into your own land. So he's talking about pulling this back together. Something that has just been separated. And Bill already worked the principle, or I should say the manifestation of being divided. And what happens when you're divided? You're, you're uh, subject to deception. You're subject to weakness. Um, you know how when uh, you get a cause or you get people together and there's a whole bunch of people and they march on, uh, up to the Capitol? There, there's power in that. If, if us guys just scooted over there and said, believe in Yahweh, who are you? Oh, douche. what are you, 20 people here? Goodbye. But when you got 20,000, 120,000, the, there's power in that unity. Okay, so go ahead. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. Yes. And you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Now, this is a whole lot different than we will do. This is Yahshua saying, I will do. Now, this is the one that's been proving himself as the Hercules all along. So, when he says something, it comes to pass. And we've, we can go through all of these stories. And when Yahshua says, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And you can, you can count on it. So, he's saying, I'm going to clean you up. You're filthy, yes, you're filthy, and you're in dire need of some cleansing. I'm going to clean you up. Go ahead. A new heart also will I give you. Didn't Bill talk about? They did not have the heart, right. and they failed. <laughs> now you're going to get a heart that won't fail. Why? Whose heart is it? Who's in the bosom of the Father? It's Yahshua, yeah. see? And that's the beauty of the story, is that it is Yahshua saving his bride. Right. It's just like the, the, in the old times, the little girls tied the little lady, she's tied to the tracks. Can she possibly get off the tracks herself? Yeah. And, and the guy, he's tied her up, and he's the villain, and he's in black, right? And then who has to come and save her? Herself? Does she suddenly have another arm to get herself? She has to be saved. Right. She has to be rescued. And that makes the beautiful story. And the guy in white comes, and he gets the villain out of the way, and he pulls her off the tracks just in time. That's what we mean. That's where they get their idea for these movies, is this is the story. So keep going there, Scott, because we're going to get to the point where he says, instead of we will do, it's Yahshua saying, I will cause you. And you know, it's totally, totally different than we will do. And, and uh, get down to that, Scott, because the point is, it's coming, and that's what we want to, you know, see. And Bill was talking about it with this Yahshua. He, he took on a death, a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He took on a death to come here and to cause us. Go ahead. A new heart also will I give you, yes. and a new spirit will I put within you. A new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. Yes. And I will give you a heart of flesh. I will do this for you, my bride. See? Go ahead. And I will put my spirit within you. Yes. And cause you to walk in my statutes. Mm -hmm. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. Cause you to walk in my statutes. Okay. So, I will cause you... Okay. Let me just get this on here. To walk in my statutes. Now you might be saying to yourself, well, what's that? What are the statutes, right? Because 
it was very clear what they were back here, right? It's all over the place, what they were back here. But what is he going to cause us to walk in now? Not so clear. In the sense of, and, and they begged, this is the story that uh, eyewitnesses of Dr. Kinley told John and I, it's Bev and Fred Allen, that people begged Dr. Kinley to write down a little, little list for them. <laughs> because they did not trust themselves and they wanted a list to follow to say they were doing the right things, that they were righteous. And could Dr. Kinley do that? No. He cannot write down a list because why? Immediately you're going to fail miserably and then you're going to be in condemnation. See? So you've got to see the liberation of the new covenant I will cause you to walk in my statutes. Now the statutes, uh, let's go over to Romans, it's 3 and 21. And we're going to talk too about, I'll cause you to walk in my statutes. There is a law of the spirit of life, right? And I think, Bill, you might have mentioned it. It's like for one, it's one thing. They could do, but the other brethren can't do it. Whatever it is, you fill in the blanks. But sometimes you say, well, you know, how can so-and-so just, you know, uh, not pay his bills and just go to every convention? I, I could not do that. And then, you know, tell the, you know, the bill collector, well, I just had to go to religion. or so, You know, I mean, whatever, fill in the blanks, you know. And the, one person can do that and another can't. It, it's whatever your conscience is dictating to you because that's where the law of the spirit of life abides as well as in the creation. And Bill talked about that philoprogenitiveness and the uh, love of offspring and the way you'll see it manifest with certain animals like a mother bear. Don't get in her way if she's got cubs. You're gone. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they're ferocious to protect those cubs. See? And then you've got other things like snakes or whatever and they just let their little things go and they don't they don't follow them around and see if they're okay they just go you know what I mean so the, it's not that the snake is a bad parent and the bear is a good parent it's just showing the two mysteries see it's just the nature of what Yahshua was showing us okay so what we want to uh, look at is um, did I ha have you holding anything Scott Yes, Romans 3.21. We're talking about walking in Yahshua's statutes, and you're not going to get a list. Be three, Go ahead. I'll pick it up in 20. Yes. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of Elohim without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Okay, so you've got, did you get down to the faith? I'm sorry, because I was looking for uh, where I wanted to go and I missed the whole thing. Did you get down to the righteousness yeah, yeah, of, okay. Um, even the righteousness of Elohim, the, which is by faith of Yahshua the Messiah. See, that's where you want to be. It's not the righteousness of Christianity. It's not the righteousness of the Catholic Church. It's not the righteousness of Buddha. It's not the Hindu righteousness. It's the righteousness of Yahweh. Is what, Scott? Which is by faith of Yahshua the Messiah unto all and upon all them that believe. Upon, mm -hmm. Okay, so that's where we've moved from. We've shifted from watching our actions and saying all that you said, God, all that you said, Yahweh Elohim, we will do, and watching ourselves fail. Frank was talking the other night about his dealings with the Catholic Church. You go in, you get your confession, you get your communion, you get all cleaned up, and he don't make it home. And he's already in a jam because it's already gone. It's already evaporated. Now what? You have to wait till another week, Frank, and go through a whole week of, of guilt and fear? I, I don't know. But you, you know, it doesn't work. It doesn't last. We're not talking about that, okay? So now um, let's go back to um, 
where Bill was in 1 Thessalonians. I'm going to get this out and not lose my time here. Now, 1 Thessalonians, Bill had us read 5 and 21. Very powerful. Nobody ever thought about that. Right. Nobody ever thought about proving all things when it came to God. Right. Right. Proving all things in mathematics, that's, that's, that's easy. Proving all things in mechanics, that's easy. You got an engine, it takes blah, 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 whatever it takes, <laughs> right? And then it goes. That's easy, right? You've got, uh, you know, gardening, you prove, you know, and that's easy to figure out. Yahweh has allowed us these things. You got gravity, it, it's easy to figure out. If you jump out the window without a parachute, you're going down. And you're going down probably to die, right? So he's given us all these laws, but prove all things, but we just didn't think about it. There were no tools to prove out God until Dr. Kinley's vision. And that's what his claim was, make me prove it. Not that I've got something that I've figured out, but make me prove that I had an experience directly from the creator of the universe. Right. And that's the only way that this can be, possibly be, people couldn't have figured this out because it's timeless. No matter where, where you go, it's still the same. It doesn't wax old. It doesn't get, um, well, we got to fix this, or oh, this doesn't work. It's timeless. It's eternal. And no matter where you go, you're going to see Yahweh working out his purpose. Like Bill started out saying, his whole purpose was to get to the, I will cause you. Now, we've talked about the righteousness of Yahweh as faith, okay? Impossible for any man to believe in Yahshua without Yahshua being your heart, giving you the heart to do that. Impossibility. Mm -hmm. Because if it was something that we could do, you just don't need him. And he's shown us so many proofs that you need him. What's your breath of life? What keeps this body going? Is your breath, right? You have to breathe. Yes. And we know here in school that we breathe the name of Yahweh. Now, some people get really, um, they cringe. Oh, I hate that one. It's so corny. Nonetheless, it's true. It is, it is true. And you breathe that name. So he's showing you from a physical standpoint, his name keeps us going. Just to show you the point that by spiritually, that name of Yahshua better be here in your heart and in your mind to pass over, right? And that's what he's showing you. When they had to pass over here, they had to have faith in the operation, right? And also when you got the high priest here, what part of Israel had a prayer of getting into the most holy place themselves on the Day of Atonement? You don't have a prayer. You got to be carried in there. I will cause you to be atoned for. I will cause you. And all he asked of Israel is you had to afflict your souls and you had to be in tune and you couldn't be playing cards or going out there and gossiping. or be, You had to afflict your soul on that day. You had to be in tune to the operation. That's all he asked, right? But he was doing all the work carrying you into the presence of Yahweh. And that's what he's still doing. Because we didn't have a prayer. If I could have 10 carnal minds sit right here in front of me and give them a piece of paper and say, explain to me how to get to heaven. They'd have 10 different ideas. <laughs> right? And they'd all think they were right because they thought it. Right? right? It's the same way we thought how we could get to heaven. Be nice, be kind, be good. You know, all those things, right? Nobody in a carnal situation would write down that it was by Yahshua giving you his heart and by giving you the proof of his operation by the Law and the Prophets. Nobody was going to write that down because this is a mystery. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? And by bringing out these points, we start to see how just how joyful and how special this thing is and we are. See?
I mean, I, I got a real kick out of it tonight. It just like, you know, okay, so me and John are opening the door. Dan's not here. People are waiting outside the door. And we bustle in and everybody, it was just like one body working in a, a race. Everybody just started doing their job, blah, 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 you know, bustling here, getting the charts up, doing their thing, joyful that we were going to be listening to the truth for two hours. It was just, I just got a kick out of it because everybody was happy to be here, see? And not so much in the church tomorrow morning. <laughs> Right? <laughs> Not so much. You got to give that money, you know, and you got to hope that so-and-so sees you and, oh, darn, my hair's not done. And here I am in church and, you know, not so much. It, just, it was just really joyful. And that's what this, this spirit, this is the way the spirit moves us. Now, we're over in First Thessalonians, and I want to pick it up, Scott. Where he's talking, you know, once again, this is Paul. And Paul's talking about the things of the heart. And pick it up in 16. And this is where I just felt like I just got to, you know, where he's saying, I was feeling this happy, you know, energy in the room and everybody working and trying to figure out the camera and get all things going and get your seat and who's doing what. And, you know, here's Paul, and he's saying in 16, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Rejoice evermore. Rejoice. Rejoice that we got a decent room. Rejoice that we can afford the room. Rejoice that nobody's, you know, got guns at the window. Rejoice evermore. Okay, keep going. Pray without ceasing. Now, we've talked about that because people that would have read that before wouldn't have understood. How do I do that? Pray without ceasing. And that's what we're just talking about, right? Is just when you've given up that, that breath of life every minute that you say in Yahweh's name, right? And he allowed that. Because we sure, really? I can't figure that one out. Pray without ceasing. He had to put that in us, see? And that's the gift that we offer back to him, the gift that he gave us, see? That breath, that spirit. Go ahead. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of Elohim in Yahshua the Messiah concerning you. Now this is where I wanted to get to, because this hit me like a ton of bricks. Okay, I had Scott go over to Romans, and he talked about the faith, right? right. And Bill talked about the faith. Bill got to that point, and he talked about the faith in the New Covenant, Okay. The faith in the new covenant is, I will cause you to walk in my statutes. I will cause you to walk in faith. I will do that for you, bride. It's just like the husband saying what he will do for the bride. I will do this for you because there's love involved here. And we've, we've seen incredible acts of uh, protectors and uh, heroes um, where um, people, when they were getting gunned down at that, um, the concert, we had husbands that fell over the top of their wives and were killed and the wives were spared because the bullets hit him and not her. And we've seen that with the teachers in the school where the teachers you know, shooed the kids in the room and the teacher was gunned down right in front of the children. We've seen these acts of protectors. And that's just manifestations that are now being, you know, viewed worldwide and people are thinking about this stuff of the, her the her heroes. And then now they're making this point, now I don't know about this poor guy, I I don't know if he's doing the right thing or the wrong thing, but they're making a really big deal about him standing outside the school for four minutes. Yeah. Trained, should be going in there. I don't know. Maybe he's trained to make sure that it's a secure situation. Because, you know, I, I don't know. To me, if I just go flying in the school, here I am, I, I might be gunned right down too. I mean, I don't know what he's supposed to do, but they're making a big deal about it that it looks like he did the wrong thing. Not the protector, not the hero. And that's just like we were over there in the 10th chapter of John and the hireling, what's the hireling do? 
He does not protect the sheep. And if there's a bear or a wolf or whatever, he's on his way running. He, the hireling does not protect. Not the shepherd, he's going to go down for his sheep, right? And he's going to make sure the 99 are in the pen, I'm going after the one. That's, that's our Yahshua. That's our, our protector. Okay, but all these things come out for you to see these, like, these manifestations in the world, and you can't miss them. I mean, John has CNN on... Um, a lot and this stuff is just everywhere they're just picking and detailing every part to see what actually is going on and what they should do now right mm -hmm. to put guns in the schools hmm I'm not going there I kind of did but I'm not <laughs> because I can just see a teacher having a bad day and just whoosh, you know <laughs> like you're you're out of here <laughs> but you know, really, really whip it out. I said for you to sit down. <laughs> anyway, what what took what what Paul is saying here? I'm going to have Scott read that again, and we're just going to break it down for a couple more minutes. Uh, we got six minutes left. Is that in everything give thanks? Okay. Now this is where I kind of would lose Paul for a while because I only could find myself feeling the giving thanks part when things were going good. MHP stuff. There, Yahshua is good and, you know. How about court roundabout action? He said, in everything, give thanks. Now, listen, that's, that's tragedy, that's illness, that's disease, that's economic problems, that's family problems, that's dysfunction, that's in everything, give thanks. How, Yahshua, how? Right? I will cause you to walk in my statutes. Now, Yahshua is in the garden, and what's this say? He's sweating like great drops of blood, right? And what's he saying? Not my will, Yash Yahweh, but thy will be done. In everything, give thanks. Okay, go ahead, Scott. For this is the will of Elohim in Yahshua the Messiah concerning you. I mean, it blows me away, right? This is the will of Elohim concerning you. Whatever's happening to you at the moment, any moment, this is the will of Elohim concerning you wow okay so that's what I'm talking about you cannot fall out like Bill talked about blind faith and believe me brother and all that stuff those people they fall out and they end up going postal and they end up taking it into their own hands because Jesus isn't answering them how about how about, uh, what's your name over there, uh, that martyr? Oh, give it to me. Oh. Teresa? Yes, what is she? Mother, Mother Teresa. Teresa. Mother Teresa. Her words, I preached out of blindness. I preached out of darkness. I felt he did not ever answer me. And she's noted as the Saint Mother Teresa. And to not make Catholics go haywire, they tried to fix it. The Pope and everybody tried to fix it and say, well, it's the same thing as Yahshua being on the cross saying, why have you forsaken me? They tried to fix it and put her up there with Yahshua on the cross. Billy Graham, what revelation did he have? You said it, Bill. He was a liar. Right. He did not have the truth. He was a liar. See? So here we are in Maddie Dale, and we'll go home to our, our houses tonight, and we'll, we'll, you know, tomorrow's another day, and the next day, and the next day. And we will continue in walking in this faith in everything, because we don't know what's around the corner. And you know what you can, the biggest blasphemy you can do? Not the biggest, but you know what's a real real killer go get your fortune read 
Go have your tea leaves read. Go read your um, horoscope. <laughs> Is that faith in Yahweh and everything? Give thanks? No. You got to say, oh, I'm so nervous. What's going to happen this week? I'm so nervous. Oh, you're going to meet a guy that's going to give you $1,000 if you give him your license plate and your social security number. <laughs> right? You're looking for the guy. You're going to act all stupid and you're going to go down. <laughs> you see what I mean? You'll start making that happen. Okay, where's the guy? Okay, okay, it's him. I'm in Wegmans. There he is right there, right? You'll start making that stuff happen, and you're going to go down. <laughs> I mean, it sounds crazy, but if you just have faith in the operation, I, I pay my bills online. I know that's dangerous. It's about as dangerous as getting in the car tonight. I mean, you have to move in the faith of the operation. But two, you can't say to yourself, you can't say, I'm going to jump off the cliff and see if Yahshua, you know, gently passes me down. He, you can't test him like that. Right. But you have to move in the faith of the operation. Let's just have that read once again. I think we're out of time, aren't we, guys? Yeah. Okay, just, let's just read that once again. In all things... 5 and 18. In everything give thanks. Yes. For this is the will of Yahweh and Yahshua the Messiah concerning you. This is the will of Yahweh. And if you go through these stories and you see how every time Yahshua is not a failing L, you'll, you'll be fine with that. I'm not going to say it's a, part, it's a walk in the park. It's not. And he didn't promise us that. But he did give us something within us that we all have to walk according to the faith. And when you walk in his statutes and the law of the spirit of life is on your side, who can be against you? Right. See, and it says they can take your life. Oh, yes. They, these, these bodies are like little blades of grass. They can take your life, but your soul, it's all covered. Thank you. Sorry. That's okay. Thank you all for being with us tonight. It was a most enjoyable class. I hope you all learned a lot and really appreciate where you were tonight. Um, if we can all stand for the doxology, we're here every Wednesday at 7.30. Every Saturday at 7 o'clock, the doxology is taken from the last two verses of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise Yahshua, our sovereign, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and for all time. Let us all stay in unison. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.